Man, special edition of Fearless with Jason Whitlock. We got D1 for a one-on-one -on -one interview. It's going to be 90 minutes to maybe two hours to maybe 10 hours. Who knows? There's so much I want to talk to this young man, this Christian rapper, this young man who's standing his ground in the music industry and everywhere. Fascinating, awesome episode of Fearless just around the corner. Welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Friday. Thank you for joining me. This episode of Fearless is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing at GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS to get $240 in free bacon with your next order. So good to have Good Ranchers uh, back with us, but even better to have D1 in studio. Round of applause, guys. D1 here in Nashville uh, with us. Uh, for my audience that's as old as me and, and or older and don't know who D1 is, D1 is one of the most talented rappers in the music industry. D1 uh, raps from a Christian perspective and point of view, but D1's got a history. You've been attached and have worked with many, if not most, of all the commercial rappers uh, around the country, and sometimes you get at odds with them with some of the truth you speak. And so uh, I've wanted to have a conversation with D1 for a, a long time because I, who would, look, who, in the Christian space, who is as popular and, and as well known as you? Man, there's a lot of artists who are doing amazing things in the Christian space, a whole lot. And I think it's actually a bad thing to, for Christians to compare themselves and be like, Who's more popular and who's not popular when it comes to Christians? Man, we are brothers and sisters doing Christ's work. So that's a trick of the enemy, my brother. And, and I don't want any of us in this entertainment space with counting followers and counting uh, likes and comments to start comparing ourselves. We all serve in the same Jesus. Awesome. That's an awesome answer. You guys that have been watching this show know that Bryson Gray has been on this show many times. Bryson Gray did a song with this show. He and Shamika did a song, Reclaim the Rainbow, that was tremendous. I'm a big fan of uh, Bizzle, I think, out in Houston. I think he's out in Houston. Uh, he's been on the show. I think you're the first rapper, that, well, no, Bryson's been in studio, but you're the first, Bryson lives here in the Tennessee area. You're the first rapper I felt compelled enough to like, man, I gotta get this dude to Nashville for a one-on-one -on -one conversation because you say a lot of profound, courageous things, particularly for someone who's just 38 years old. Uh, but I, I want to go all the way back to the beginning. And, and for government name, what, what, D1. David Augustine Jr. De from? New Orleans, <laughs> that 504. 504. And I was reading up, you, you were a basketball player. Absolutely. Before hip-hop. Basketball was definitely my first love. So I played played in high school. I got cut from the team my freshman year. Which in high school? In high school. And I didn't even go to a high school that was known for sports. But I was coming from just being a street baller my whole life. I had no fundamentals, you know? So when I got cut freshman year, it bruised my ego, but it bolstered my work ethic. And I used to hoop before school, during lunch, and after school every day freshman year after I got cut. By sophomore year, I made varsity and was starting on varsity. By senior year, I had broken a whole bunch of the scoring records in the school. First player from that school to get to make the Louisiana Junior Nationals team, making the all-star game, all that type of stuff. Wow, and so did you try to play basketball at LSU? Man, I wanted to, but uh, I have a very rare disorder. Uh, some call it a disease, some call it a disorder. It's called achalasia, and it impacts my esophagus, my stomach, my ability to uh, keep my food down when I eat. And I got afflicted with this during high school. So right after basketball season, senior year, I had a massive surgery on my stomach. I got five slits going across my stomach for where they had to cut me open, and at that point, I missed about a month and a half, almost two months of school uh, that, that spring semester. 
And afterwards, my, my desire to play basketball on a college level was still there, but I had lost uh, a good bit of weight, number one. And number two, the coaches who I had been talking to from some smaller schools, they were a little nervous because of my health conditions. So I did go to LSU and, you know, I had mentally, I, I bucked my head up to think like, come on, D, you can do anything through Christ. And yeah, you, you're going to make the team and you're going to be this comeback kid and this success story. You'll walk on and then you'll become a starter and then you'll make it to the NBA. Man, I got cut so quick from that team, so <laughs> I didn't make it. Uh, I didn't make the team. I also went to LSU because my girlfriend at the time uh, was going to LSU. So I was like, well, if I can't have my first love of basketball, I can have my second love of, you know, my girl, because I love basketball a lot at that time. And I got cut from the team, and my girlfriend cheated on me with a football player, man. So. You know, you you play football, right? Yeah. I, oh, I hate you, bro. Just for the record, I hate I'm I got PTSD. Any football players, bro, I automatically like I got like a certain level of like beef with you, bro. Just know that. I see that you wear a medallion with a picture of I believe your grandmother. Yes, sir. The the it's it's funny you say is your grandmother, is she part of your faith walk, faith journey, or Absolutely. So this is Miss Lois Augustine in New Orleans. We call our grandparents Mama and Papa, you know, so this is Mama. And, you know, she's played a big part. My first memory of anything faith-based is her rewarding me as a preschooler for memorizing the Our Father prayer, you know, and her being proud of me for that. Not for memorizing songs, rapping about twerking, you hear me, and rapping about shooting people and selling dope, but she rewarded me for memorizing the Our Father prayer and for being able to recite it in front of her friends and her being proud of me. So I got so many memories, Jay, of my grandmother like nudging me in the right direction, closer to Christ, you hear me? And yeah, so she passed away uh, like in 2020. And you know, I'm not a dude that, uh, I'm not a flashy dude. I don't have, you know, I don't have no tattoos or nothing like that. Um, this watch was a gift. These rings collectively cost a total of about $80, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but if I, if I was gonna get something nice, uh, I wanted to get my grandma. It, it, I mentioned that just because my grandmother was such a big part of my faith journey and just of my life. And when you mentioned that thing, I can do anything through Christ. I followed football so closely as a kid that even as a kid, when I was like, you know what, in order, I need to be six foot three in order to uh, reach all my football dreams. And so my grandmother said, well, just claim it in the name of Jesus Christ and it'll happen, Jay. <laughs> so probably around seventh, eighth grade, I just started saying, I'm 6'3", and I'm claiming it in the name of Jesus Christ. I only got to be about six foot. And so, but it's good enough to get a Division One football scholarship to Ball State, but mm -hmm. my grandmother, Lovey Kennedy, very central to my faith walk. And so it's interesting to hear that from you. But, let, looking at the picture of your grandmother, tell me your... Uh, Race. Yes. Yeah, black. Your grandmother? Or My grandmother black, bro. This is, you looking at, you looking at some New Orleans, like light skin, breeding with light skin, breeding with more light skin, breeding with more light skin, just generationally, you, you, you looking at the complexion of that. Now, of course, of or course. Creole or what? It, I don't know what Creole is when it comes to a, a race. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I've always been opposed to that, man. Like growing up in New Orleans, there's this classism to where a lot of people act like light skin is better than brown skin or dark skin. And I hate that because my mother looks just like you. She's either your complexion or a little darker. You heard me? So I always used to hate when people would be like, so you black or you Creole? Man, what are you talking about, man? Like I'm black. Like what is Creole? Make that make sense. So my grandmother, grandfather, just real light skin. Speaking of being light-skinned, uh, we have a part of our family that practices something called passe blanc. That means that they pass for white. That's a French term. And my grandmother first told me about what passe blanc is, so she explained to me as a little kid. She said, David, we don't know part of our family because when people like me and your grandfather made a decision that although we're real light-skinned, we know that we're black, so we're going to live as black people, part of our family they chose to pass for white. So although they're black, they live as white people. And they're so light-skinned that you, you can't really tell. So what they did was they chose to disown people like my grandmother and my grandfather for choosing to live as black. So there's part of the Augustine family and going a few generations back, there's part of them that I don't even know. 
Hmm. When did uh, the love of rap music hit you? The love of rap music hit me when I was an elementary schooler. The first concert I ever went to was uh, a little teenage group by the name of Criss Cross. <laughs> you know, you know who that is? On the jump jump. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so imagine me and my best friend Carl, rest in peace to my boy Carl. Imagine us. I'm the light skinned dude in Criss Cross, and he the brown skinned dude in Criss Cross. You know, we looking at them, we like, man, they look like us. And we seeing them with their clothes on backwards. We seeing them making these rap songs, and they dancing, and they jumping. And we just some little young dudes who are like, yo, this, they make, whatever they're doing, they make it seem so fun. We want to be like them. They happened to be on tour. They came to New Orleans. I think it was to the Sanger Theater. And Miss Malkia, uh, Carl's mom, she brought us to the concert. And man, we just fell in love with them dudes at that point. So much so that the next day we went to school and we wore our clothes backwards like them. And it was all good until I had to go to the bathroom. Because <laughs> as, as a little elementary schooler, trying to have the motor skills to, like, man, I got to pee right now. But I can't quite reach the back of me to unbutton and then unzip the jeans. And they too tight to pull them straight down. And I, and I peed on myself, man. And I was like, dang. But uh, it's like it woke me up from that, that, that dream real quick. I was like, you are not Criss Cross, boy. You are David. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So as an elementary school kid, you fall in love with Criss Cross. Did you think, I want to be a rapper then, too, as well? Never. 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 I was too reserved, too, too shy. Just a dude that liked to, uh, uh, I like to be the assist man. So I like to, you know, hype somebody else up who was clearly outgoing and who was clearly had that it factor. And that person was Carl. That was my best friend. He had the it factor. He was in commercials. He was in movies. He just had the it factor about him. So I would, I would hype him up and buck him up, you know, to, to go it on and like, yeah, man, rap for them. Or tell my other boy, William, like, yeah. Or Charlie, yeah, Charlie, go, Charlie's hilarious. Man, go crack a joke uh, about this person. Make us all laugh. I was just that person. I, I never thought this would be me. Like I said, Carl got killed and, um, um, Things just change, you know. I all of a sudden it's kind of like getting getting called when you're on the bench, you know, and you've been on the bench uh, for your whole career, and then you see the coach look down the bench and he call your name, Augustine. We need you in there, you know. And so, what happened with Carl? How did killed? How he got murdered in New Orleans? In, how old or how old were you? Yeah. So this was right when I graduated college when Carl got killed. So. One of my other best friends, Ryan, he got murdered my freshman year in college. Carl got murdered as uh, soon as I graduated. And when Carl got killed, um, I'll be honest with you, it was, it was a culmination of a lifestyle that he had been uh, choosing for a while to like lean into the streets, you know? And it pains me to this day to think about losing my best friend because I know how innocent he was, I know his true heart, but I also saw him succumb to negative peer pressure in the streets of New Orleans to where, man, we used to get made fun of when we would catch the streetcar, you know, that's like the trolley, I don't know if you know about that, but we'd catch the streetcar to Canal Street, then catch the public transportation, the RTA bus, to our cribs where we lived at, and, you know, you had students from other schools who would be like, man, that's them nerds, man, look, they got... They got books inside their backpack. You know, it's like, what you think, bro? We doing our homework. We making good grades. But that was frowned upon in the streets. You know what I'm saying? That was frowned upon. And I was the dude that was like, man, forget them dudes. If they want to fight, we can fight. If they want to make fun of us, it is what it is. Carl was the dude that was like, man, I'm tired of getting made fun of. You know what I'm saying? Like, I kind of want them to like me. So he was seeking acceptance from the wrong crowd. The crowd that don't really love us, you know what I mean? And they, they're not trying to do anything positive with their academic life, but you start seeking acceptance from them, so you stop wanting to do your homework, you know? I see you starting to fail tests on purpose, just so you don't seem like the smart guy, you know? Um, they used to call me the smart guy in school, and that was a TV show, I think, um, who, who was it? It was Tia and Tamara, you know the twins, the actresses? Tia and Tamara, Maori? Vaguely. Okay, well they had a little brother, and he, uh, he had his own show called The Smart Guy. So he used to call me The Smart Guy, you know. It's funny how you don't get lifted up oftentimes in, in, in our culture and in our society for being smart and trying to do better. But, um, and especially in our community, in the black community, you know. Um, 
But I just was able to put up with it, man, because while y'all making fun of me, my grandma loving me and my grandma rewarding me, you hear me? And she proud of me for these same good grades. So I had that balanced off. I saw Carl start to change and that led to him um, just, you know, starting to make bad decisions, bro. And he turned into um, a product of the streets. Some would jump to the conclusion He's in rap, and so maybe he got caught up in the gangster rap element of mm. it, but yours, that's not really the case. He was listening to it. We were all listening to it. And the difference is, some of us who were listening to it were actually trying to live out those lyrics, the gangster rap lyrics that we were listening to. A lot of my friends actually got caught up trying to live out those lyrics. But some of my friends, including myself, we had a home life, they had enough love, you heard me, and enough structure to where we were able to be like the chosen few who were like, we listening to this music, but we not out here trying to act it out. I also went to Ghana, West Africa as a 13 year old. That changed my perspective forever. How did that happen and what happened? Man, shout out to Miss Deborah Harley. That was my kindergarten and first grade teacher, right? Black woman in New Orleans. She started a nonprofit program to where she was like, I want to have a cultural exchange trip to where I can take these kids from this inner city and expose them to the motherland and expose them to their roots so that they can have a greater appreciation for who they are. Man, at a time where I'm listening to lyrics, rapping about murder, rapping about drug dealing, rapping about running trains on women and disrespecting women, I get to go to Ghana and I get to see these amazing, beautiful brothers and sisters who are taking their education seriously, who are treating their elders and their peers with respect and who are not the slightest bit materialistic. They not worried about rims on cars. They worry about clean water in their village. They not worry about jewelry and Jabot jeans and Reebok tennis shoes like us. They worried about having a smile on their face when they wake up in the morning because they grateful to God that they still here. That experience for three weeks changed me forever, bro. So <clears throat> most 13 year olds wouldn't digest that experience and interpret that experience the way that you did. They would just be like, man, I'm in a foreign country. This is a fun trip. I'm seeing different things. What, why do you think you were able to understand it on that level? Because we had something that the rap game severely lacks, which is we had great leadership from our elders. The people on the trip, the adult chaperones, made us do journals and we had to self-reflect on Almina Slave Castle, you hear me? When we go walk into this slave castle and when we see these kids whose parents have to walk miles each day and balance this big old thing on top of their head uh, to where they put clean water in it and they have to walk for miles. Women walking for miles with this on top of their head, you feel me, just to bring clean water back for their family. We had to reflect on these things, Jay. And once you reflect on what you're seeing around you and what you're taking part in, it helps you to internalize it. So it wasn't just, let's just come here and just take pictures for Instagram, you know, like, like today's culture is. So I saw what great leadership from elders can produce, which is a younger generation who self-reflects and who's ahead of their time and doesn't have to bump their head as much. I went on that trip, man. My boy Carl ain't get to go on that trip. And some of my other friends who we lost to the hood, everybody, a lot of my people who played at Digby Playground with me in New Orleans East, you know what I'm saying? Like, play baseball, basketball, football, all that stuff. Man, they didn't get these type of experiences. And the music we were listening to, you a fool if you act like the music that we listening to was just entertaining us. Man, that music that we were listening to, that stuff was making us want to emulate these people. Absolutely. Your brain is still forming as a teenager. You're not sitting here with the discernment to say, well, I really like it, but it's really toxic, so I'm just not going to do it. I was afraid to live that stuff because I had to answer to mama, papa, mama, and daddy if I would have tried to do any of that stuff. I didn't even want my parents to know that I was listening to this music in my room. Me and my little sister shared a room for a long time, right? But as soon as they put a wall up in between, we had a small room already, then as we started to get older, you know, it was kind of like, ah, they can't be sharing the room. It's a boy and a girl. So they put a wall up in the middle of an already small room. So I had a little cubby hole, but it was my room. So that was a sacred space for me. 
man, that's when I was like, finally, I get to listen to the music I want to. My little sister not gonna rat on me. I can listen to it. I just gotta keep the volume low or put my headphones on. So I'm digesting all this because as a black dude growing up at that time, you want to fit in with your peers. And that's what all your friends listening to. So you want to be able to relate to everybody. So I'm listening to this, but I was always like, man, I'm not finna jump out there and try to actually do this stuff. Cause when I come in this house, the wrath of my parents and my grandparents is something I don't want to deal with. Not all of my friends either had that fear or that reverence for the adults in their household or not all of them um, were, you know, afraid to jump out there and, and, and take a chance or make a mistake. And some of my friends, they didn't get a second chance after they made a first mistake. So many things I want <clears throat> to ask off that response, but I, I kind of want to try to stick to chronological order. So I got to make a mental note to jump back and ask a couple follow-up questions about that. But when did you decide you wanted to be a rapper? After my freshman year in college, when all in one year, Ryan got murdered, right? I got that text message in the middle of English class as a college freshman that my boy Ryan had just got killed in Punch of Train Park. Um, um, that same year, I got cut from the basketball team. That same year, my girlfriend cheated on me with a football player, um, you know, messed me up. And my roommate at the time, I saw him start to sell, uh, sell drugs. Literally, we were sharing a dorm room together. At LSU. At LSU, you know what I'm saying? And he wasn't like that, man. He wasn't cut like that. You know, his family was well off. They were doing well. He was, uh, yeah, he was just a dude that I saw trying to fit in. Once again, trying to fit in. Like, dog, you live in a gated community back in New Orleans, boy, but you sitting here acting like you drugging and thugging. You not like that, but I saw that, so we fell out. Uh, after all of that, man, um, that's when I found Christ. Yeah. That's not when I found the streets. That's not when I found revenge on all my enemies and go and want, you know, shoot up something. Nah, that's when I found Jesus. And for myself, in a real way, to where it was like, your identity is not being a basketball player. Your identity is not found in being this person's girlfriend and y'all the cutest couple on campus. Your identity is not found in hanging with this certain clique uh, from New Orleans and y'all, you know, unbreakable, cause yeah, you done fell out with all them dudes for the most part your freshman year. So it was like, dang, my identity got to be found in something that's immovable, that ain't going to never change. And that word of God ain't changing, man. So that's when I made the best decision ever of my life. And it was like, from here on out, for however long I have, I'm, uh, I'm, living, I'm living for you, God. So you're 19, 20 years old. What does that look like for a 19 or 20 year old? What, what happens when you make that decision? How, how does your behavior change? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I stopped selling cocaine. I'm just playing. I was never selling cocaine. Oh, <laughs> nah, but uh, at that point, being in college and being at a school like LSU where partying is very much celebrated, uh, like I said, drugging and thugging, you know what I'm saying? Ratchet culture at its finest. The, the invention of the term ratchet, you know, came from there, from Louisiana, uh, around that time, too. Um, it was me just being like, no, I have, to, I have to understand that this is what the world wants me to do, and the pleasure that's going to come from this is actually going to cause pain to God. I had to be able to discern that and ask myself, was that temporary pleasure worth it? I also had uh, a professor in college by the name of Dr. Leonard Moore. He was at LSU. He's now at UT Austin. This is uh, a strong believer, right, a Christian, um, an unapologetic black man with a Ph.D. who is a real leader and is like, y'all not finna trick me out of who I am, but I know the order of operations. I'm not a black man before I'm a man of God. You know what I'm saying? I'm a man of God first, and, and I'm smart, and I'm out here making this money. First man to ever show me a pay stub to where I was like, man, this man make more than $100,000 a year. Like, that's crazy. Nobody in my family never came close to that, you feel me? And I see this from my black history professor, and he had a big impact on me, so that when I did choose to start living for God, it became a little easier to feel like I'm not missing out on nothing. Y'all are actually just falling for the okie doke and for the trick of the devil to get you wanting to do drugs and thinking you gotta do drugs to have fun at this party. I could go to the parties with y'all, but I'm gonna be drinking water. It's water, right? Yeah. <laughs> Fearless army. 
I'm going to be drinking water if I go. Um, I can still hang with y'all. Like, I can, I can still hang with y'all, but I'm not interested in talking about just things that really don't matter, you know, that's just of the world. You feel me? So that's, that's what rubbed off on me. And when I started doing music right around that time, I was like, yo, if I'm going to do music, I can't be one person in real life, but be a whole nother person on the microphone. And that right there led me to say, oh, I'm about to make music that it ain't gonna necessarily be popular, but if I get real, real good to where I master my craft and I got that it factor, like my boy Carl, you know what I'm saying? Like that it factor, then I could probably turn this into something. And it didn't happen right away, but I'm sitting on your couch right now. So you make the decision to, to go into rap and you, you graduate from LSU? No, I dropped out. I'm just playing. Yeah, of course I graduated. Man, you supposed to do your research, man. You supposed to know this. Well, I'm letting you inform me. Yeah, brother, this. I'm playing with y'all joking. <laughs> Absolutely. I proudly graduated with a degree in business with a concentration in marketing. And did you ever take a corporate job or did you then go straight into being an independent rapper or just a rapper? Yeah, you're asking great questions, man. Uh, my senior year, approximately two months before I graduated, I was uh, hooping with one of my boys at the time in college at our apartment complex. And while we were outdoors playing basketball, um, these three dudes walked up to us and we were victims of an armed robbery. They thought we had broken into their homeboy's car, right? Their homeboy was somebody that was uh, really popular, really popular. And they called themselves, you know, avenging whoever broke into their, avenging their homeboy's loss. So they asked us if we broke into the car. And I was like, nah, bro, like we sitting here playing one-on-one, -on -one, brother, with our basketball clothes on. We have no idea. I'm sorry to hear that, though, you know, that that happened. So two of them, they were like, I right, bet. So they kind of went to walk away. One of them, this short dude in the middle, he, um, he ain't believe us, so he pulled a gun out his waistband, you know what I mean? And he put the gun right there, bro, right there, right there on my temple, man. And I'm sitting there, and as I'm sitting there like this, and he telling me, oh, I'm, about to, I'm about to blow your brains out, da 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 all this stuff, right? Because he thinking that we broke into his homeboy's car. And as I'm sitting there with my hands like this, the only thing I kept thinking was, dang, I didn't think that I was going to go out the same way my boy Ryan went out a few years ago by getting, getting shot back in New Orleans. And also in that moment, I was thinking there was so much more that I could have done during my life to make God proud but I was too afraid to be ostracized or not fit in. So even though I'm living for God and I'm a Christian at this point, I'm like, I know I could have went harder. I know I could have been bolder. And I'm thinking this stuff, bro, in real time while my hand's right here. And then a the little part of me was thinking, what if I just hurry up and do this and, and try to grab the gun? You know, a little part of me, not, not much, but that was the third thought. But I was thinking that, bro, and I just thought my life was over with. So a young lady was walking to her apartment on the second floor. She looked down on the basketball court and saw what was happening. And when she saw this, she gasped, like, like, oh my God, you know what I mean? And when she did that, that caught everybody's attention. So they all looked up there, and, and now you got a witness, you know? So they, they get paranoid. So they put the gun up, they take our stuff, and they, they go, they run off, you know what I mean? Um, I lived. At that point, bro, I was like, all right, man, it's game time. Like, I really don't know how long I have on this earth. So I'm about to graduate and I'm a business major. I'm expected to go into corporate America, but I wanna make impact more than income at this point. I wanna make impact. I'm gonna be straight. I ain't grew up with a lot. I'm gonna be straight. I never been a baller, never been a baller. So with that being said, what can I do to make impact? And I was like, I could be a teacher, make direct impact with the youth every day. And two months before graduation, I made the decision I wanted to be a teacher and I became a middle school math teacher. I taught math and I taught a, a subject called life skills. How long did you do that? Two years. So right after graduation, I jumped into that. Even the way I got the job, bro, God just has had his hand on me so much. Man, I'm going to the, I'm going to the school. It's right near my apartment. I'm like, oh, this will be a quick uh, commute to and from work every day. I go there looking fresh, you know, shirt, tie, haircut at the time, you know, that's before all this. And I go to give my resume to the, to the receptionist, the secretary, and I explain who I am. I just graduated college. And she just had a very mean, very mean 
ugly, dirty, nasty attitude with me and just looking like we don't have any openings. Uh, no, the principal's not available. He's not here. Uh, sorry, you know, just go back somewhere. Well, ma'am, could I maybe like, when, when will he be here? I would love to just say, hey, da da, no, he's not here. Da 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 da. All right, cool, right? So, um, I'm like, dang, if I want, I could play the race card at the time because I'm like, oh, it's a white woman, you know what I mean? And I'm like, is it that? Like, I don't know what it is, but I don't even want to just jump to that. So I'm just like, dang, this ain't what's up. So I walk out the office feeling dejected, you heard me? And I see Miss Minnie, a janitor, older woman. She mopping the floors. She said, baby, you look so handsome. What you doing here today? I said, how you doing, ma'am? Um, I just came here to, you know, I was trying to get a job, but the receptionist, golly, like she just giving me a hard time. I can't even talk to the, to the principal, you know? She was like, I'm gonna tell you something. She said, he gets here at 6.45 in the morning on Wednesdays, right? So I was like, she was like, tomorrow is Wednesday. She said, if you come here early at 6.45, he drive a Jaguar, you and him will be the only people here and you could catch him when he parks, and you could meet him and talk to him then. She was like, don't tell nobody I told you that. I go to the school the next morning, I see that black Jaguar pulling in, 6.45, I was already there, you heard me? I met him, talked to him, told him who I was, told him my heart, and he was like, you know what, young man? I don't have any openings. I'm not gonna lie to you, we don't just, so she, was, she wasn't lying. They didn't have any openings, but he was like, I love your heart and your spirit. He was like, and our students, specifically at this school in the hood, Right here, these students need to see that type of example from a black man like you. I'm gonna create a position for you. So we basically created a position to where I designed this course called Life Skills or Study Skills. And I, I made the curriculum and it was like an elective that the students had to take. So I became a teacher right then and there. And why did you leave teaching? Because I realized that the rappers, that's who had the ear of my students. Me as their teacher, Mr. Augustine, everybody loved Mr. Augustine. They love coming to my class, but I got 30 students a day, five students in each class. That's 150 students that I'm able to reach each semester, you feel me? But these rappers, they had my students wanting to walk like them. They had my students wanting to talk like them. One of my students got a tattoo, you heard me, Jason? They said M-O-B on it. You know what M-O-B stands for? Yeah. Money over B-I, there you go. Middle schooler. I said, bro, why did you get that tattooed on you? You know what that mean? He said, no, sir. I was like, what you, what you mean, no, sir? Then why did you get it? Because his favorite rapper, Lil Wayne, had that same tattoo on his chest. So that influenced my student to blindly get a tattoo, not even knowing what it meant. So I was like, oh yeah, rappers got the influence, man. I've been rapping since college. I'm just a local rapper, you feel me? But I want to take a chance on myself at this point. I want to take a chance and jump out there and see if I could really make it. Because if I make it as D1, I could, I could have the same heart that Mr. Augustine, the teacher, has, but I could just have the platform of a popular rapper. And with that platform, I could now influence the masses. And that's what motivated me after two years to no longer be a teacher and to say I'm gonna try to make it as a rapper. With no record deal, never having been paid for a show, never having made a dime off of music, but feeling like I saved my money a little bit from two years of teaching, I'm gonna live off my savings, I got my faith in Christ, let's get it. And I know I could rap. I know I could spit with the best of them. So anytime somebody want me to rap, oh, you want me to rap? Say less. I'm gonna, I'm gonna burn it down. You feel me? So what do you say to the rappers and or media uh, critics or, or people in the media who cover the music industry that pretend like the rap music, oh, it really doesn't have any influence over the kids. And, you know, it's no different than a movie or a TV show. You know, little kids singing my booty hole brown, my coochie pink. That, that, that's harmless. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you say to people that are in that denial? I feel sorry for them. First of all, I'm not falling for y'all tricks of acting like you really are in denial of the impact that hip hop has. Hip hop has life changing impact. Now that, that, that life changing impact can be positive or negative, but I ain't finna sit here and play with y'all, man, and act like you really believe that. You're saying that to protect your job. 
You're saying that because the validation that you get from working for that corporate entity or that big brand or that label makes it to where you don't want to acknowledge that this can really have like a detrimental impact on the youth. But you know it. That's why your own kids ain't allowed to listen to it at home. Mr. Industry person who wants to act like it's just entertainment. Like, man, stop, man. Y'all know better than that, bro. You can fool the other ones because they, they ain't from where I'm from. They ain't seen what I've seen. You can fool the other people to thinking that just because you phrase it a certain way that you really mean that, man, you don't mean that, man. And if you're not black and you're saying that, when I've seen the impact that this has had on our culture, then you're a culture vulture. But now we got to start getting to the point to where we say, well, you can be a black culture vulture as well. Because you know that you don't even believe what you're saying right now, but to protect your position or your popularity inside society, you'll say some stuff like, nah, this is just entertainment. Nah, it, it, ain't our, it, it ain't our fault. Like, it's the parents' fault. They need to be doing better. Okay, what about when the parents are doing better? Because parents absolutely, absolutely need to take responsibility for how they're raising their kids. But man, music reaches people in a way that your parents, your teachers, your pastors, and your coaches can't. I can't name you not one sermon from my pastor from 20 years ago, but I could rap you all the rap lyrics of my favorite songs from 20 years ago right now. Stop playing with me, man. Like, stop. That's, that's what I say to that. And I say it from a passionate place, Jay, just because people know better, but it's just, man, I'm getting paid off of this. And it's affecting my pocketbook and my popularity if I speak out against it. Or it's affecting my friendship with these labels or with these artists. Man, I don't have beef with any artist on the face of this earth. I don't have beef with any uh, label person or anything on the face of this earth. But you can love the sinner but hate the sin. And that right there, that's what I'm on, bro. That's what I'm on. For 10 years, Patriot Mobile has been America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. And when I say only, trust me, they're the only one. Founder Glenn Story and his team have been great supporters of this show, which is why I am proud to partner with them. Patriot Mobile offers dependable nationwide coverage, giving you the ability to access all three major networks, which means you get the same coverage you've been accustomed to without funding the left. When you switch to Patriot Mobile, you're sending the message that you support free speech, religious freedom, the sanctity of life, the Second Amendment, and our military veterans and first responders. Their 100% U.S.-based customer service team makes switching easy. Keep your number, keep your phone, or upgrade. Their team will help you find the best plan for your needs. Just go to patriotmobile.com Jason or call 972-PATRIOT. Get free activation when you use the offer code Jason. Join me. Make the switch today. PatriotMobile.com slash Jason. That's PatriotMobile.com slash Jason or call 972-PATRIOT. Yeah, I've tried to, I've been arguing this for a long, because I'm a huge hip hop fan or used to be. Uh, and you know, I'm old, so I, I was there at the very, very beginning. And, and, but to try to say, to com even to compare it to movies, and you know, like I love the movie The Godfather, but, I can't repeat the the things that were said in the movie The Godfather the way that I can. If, if Sugar Hill Gang, Rappers Delight comes on, once I hear the beat or whatever, the, the lyrics just come back to me instantly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if you put on, I can remember when N.W.A. first came out, and I haven't heard the song Gangsta Gangsta probably in 20 years. But if it came on, I could start rapping the lyrics. Music leaves an imprint on your soul that scientists know this, uh, people that want to control specific demographics or what they know this. And the, the, the level of denial about it is infuriating, but th there's been some kind of brainwashing job done to where we as black people think that if we criticize hip hop, we're being anti-black. There you go, and that's a trick of Satan right there. That's a trick of Satan to, to have it to where something that we all want, which is acceptance from our own, you know what I mean? We want acceptance from our own people, but Satan will have you sitting here thinking like, yo, the only way to get acceptance from your own people is to have to go against the things that you know in your heart are not right. 
and too many people falling for the bait. It's called cognitive dissonance. Our culture is afflicted with cognitive dissonance to where there's an inconsistency in what we know is right and what we believe, but what we are doing and what we are actively practicing. So for artists, I feel sorry for a lot of artists because I know that deep down, these are really good people. These are really good people, but they have gotten uh, fame, popularity, and wealth from glorifying the lowest side of who they are. You heard me? So because you've been rewarded for that, now you feel like I got to keep showcasing that side of me, the worst, most negative side of who I am, because that's what's paying the bills. And a lot of these artists, they are prisoners to their own persona because they're not really that in real life. But that's what they are glorifying and that's what they are reaching the masses with is that type of image. So I feel bad about that. And that cognitive dissonance is something that I teach about. You know, I'm a college professor now, so I teach this to my class. I literally was teaching them about cognitive dissonance yesterday because who we really have to start getting on, Jay, is the fans. Because at this point, it's the media people and it's the fans who are employing this cognitive dissonance where it's like, you know better but you still continue to consume this and egg on this type of behavior because in the words of T.I. a few years ago, he had a song called My Life, Your Entertainment. So what that means is these rappers are really living this, having to live this, this duality to where I'm really one way, but I'm portraying that I'm another way. Now I'm becoming more and more of this character that I'm portraying. Now I'm really catching the charge and going to jail. Now I'm really about to sit here and get murdered. You know what I'm saying? And all of this is happening in real life. Now I'm really contemplating suicide. I'm really becoming a drug addict. I'm really, like, uh, like Future said in one of his... Uh, interviews that Nicki Minaj talked about. Um, Nicki Minaj said Future told her, I don't do all these drugs that I rap about, but people think I do. And Nicki Minaj was like, well, that's messed up, Future, because you misleading a whole generation who's starting to do those drugs, thinking that you do them as well because you rap about them and make them sound so good. But now you got all these rappers that's getting caught in this duality that they're not really prepared for. But to the fans, they're just like, man, it's entertaining. So we want more of it. We want more of it. Like the fans are actually helping to keep the artists inside of this slavery. Because if the fans were like, you know what? We don't want that no more, man. Like now, nah, we, we don't want hear music. We don't want hear murder music no more. We don't want hear music disrespecting women and glorifying drugs. We don't want to hear that no more. You know what? Rest in peace to my grandpa. You know what a lot of artists would do, Jay? They would change their tune. <sighs> Most of that I agree with, but I, I want to ask, you talked about cognitive dissonance, and you've also talked about, take Carl and everybody, acceptance. And to me, what it comes down to, and again, I, I'm 56, I'm much older than you. Where I've landed is, it, it comes down to, because we all do want acceptance, but acceptance from who? Mm. And so once I started saying, you know what, I want to be accepted by Jesus Christ. Mm. Period, end of story. I don't, want, I don't want to be accepted by anybody else. And so if my pursuit of acceptance by Jesus Christ offends anyone, I don't care. Okay. And, and so I, I'm really out here performing for an audience of one. And, and that, if that irritates my mother, someone I don't know, my brother, whomever, I don't care. I'm hopefully it'll be pleasing to you because hopefully you'll be performing for that same person. It'll inspire you to want to do that, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's people seeking acceptance from black people or liberals or conservatives or whatever's popular in high school. That's a path for destruction because those people are all clueless. I'm clueless. Mm -hmm. The Bible is not clueless. There you it's go. 2,000 years of collected wisdom. There you go. And so if I'm, tr and this never moving and not changed, hasn't changed in, in all these years, if I'm trying to live a life that is pleasing to God, I'm going to be okay. And, and so that, that's where I think the mistake, and again, this is where, and I want to dive deeper into uh, because, I, you know, I'm someone that uh, when I was in college, uh, big fan of Louis Farrakhan, used to go to 
Savior's Day and get shipments of his on cassette tapes. I don't know, you probably ain't even old enough to remember cassette tapes, but uh, cassette tapes of, of his speeches and all that. And that, that's back when I had a lot more racial idolatry running through my veins. And, and as I got closer to God and Jesus, the racial idolatry and just like, mm, I'm an image bearer of Christ. Mm. I really don't care about being black. Mm. I care about being an image bearer of Christ. Mm. That's what's freed me and allowed me to move in a more positive direction, away from a lot of negativity and a lot of stupid actions that I thought, because I used to think, <laughs> Hanging at the strip club and running around. I got a lot of friends that are rappers, you know, and, and I, I can't speak ill of them. Tech Nine, I've known for a long time. Mm. Uh, and, you know, hit the clubs with them and all that. But none of that's important to me anymore. Man. And, and that's where we got to get to. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that you're in that space in your life. I'm very thankful that you're in that space. I'm also in that space in my life. So now I'm going to... Um, you know, oftentimes I, I'm able to learn from my students because although they might be younger than me, uh, they just are brilliant. You know, their mindsets are brilliant. So I'm going to like speak to you right now. I fully agree with everything you've said. I've gotten to that point, too. If you're watching this at home, which y'all need to be watching this and sharing this, rank your order of who you are living for and who you are finding your identity in right now. Rank your order. Does your Lord and Savior come first? Does your race come first? Does your city and your region that you're from come first? Does your block that you're from come first? Does your occupation and your occupational identity come first? Rank that. Add in sexuality to that. Add in sexuality. That's six categories. If it's not God that is first in terms of who your identity is found in, and specifically Jesus Christ, you heard me, at the end of the day, you're getting it wrong if you're putting your sexuality, your racial identity, your uh, social economic status, your, um, uh, your black, your city. If any of that comes before your creator, come on, man. This is the day to change that. You heard me? This is the day to change that. Like, like we could literally, it could be like, man, I was watching a podcast and fooling around and it changed the direction of my life. L let's let that happen today. So that's number one. Whoosh, cut, print. That need to go out. Secondly, people like us who are saying, yo, our attachment to and our faith in our Lord, right, comes first in our lives. And people like us with platforms, it's very important that we are very intentional about how we communicate our message to people. Because automatically that's not going to be well liked by the world. So what we have to do is show a level of empathy and understanding for the people who may have that order real, like, screwed up right now, and they're putting their race first, or they're putting their social economic status first, or they're putting their sexuality, or they, they hood that they're from first. So we got to be to the point where we're not becoming like them. When Jesus hung with lepers, what happened? When he stopped hanging around them, they no longer had leprosy. It wasn't that when he stopped hanging around them, he had what they had. He was able to say, I can coexist with you, but I can also impact you more than you're going to impact me because I'm able to, in a nuanced way, reach you with love, but also hit you with that grace and hit you with that level of like, man, this is my dude right here. But I want more of what he has than he wants of what I have. And that's what we got to be, bro. You know, you're a polarizing dude. Yes. You know that. Yes. That's not a bad thing, but it's just very important that like for me, I wish they would try to hit me with the, what D, why do you have these certain artists that aren't Christians on your songs? And why are you friends with these certain gangster rappers and all this? Stuff? I wish they would try to hit me with that. Oh, explain that though, because it's not a hit. It's more a, an explanation or just seeking uh, wisdom or, because that is the question I want to ask. That's you. a question, all right. Because, because again, just, just to be transparent, Tech Nine, I still consider a very good friend of mine. If he called me right now, there's nothing I wouldn't do for him. There's people I know far shadier than Tech Nine that are friends of mine. They can call me right now. I'm still going to do for them. They're still friends of mine. So I'm not for discarding mm -hmm. anybody or anything. But 
when they're with me, I'm gonna be doing God. Yeah. And and yeah. I'm gonna be trying to point them in a different direction. But anyway, I, I did that is something I want as a Christian rapper, you have a lot of associations and do a lot of work with worldly rappers or commercial rappers or whatever. How do you balance that or what is your strategy? What are you trying to do with that? Man, I'm tired of talking. I'm gonna let the Bible talk for me. You hear me? <laughs> so this is what I'm trying to do with that. Mark chapter two, verse 13. Jesus calls Levi. Oh, for one second. All right. I'm gonna call it up here on my commentary Bible as, uh, Let's go. as, as you talk. Go. Mark chapter two, verse 13. Go ahead. Yeah, because when they try to tell me, D, you're this type of rapper, and this other person is this type of rapper, man, we are all rappers. So with that being said, uh, am I a New Orleans rapper? Am I a, uh, am I a sinless rapper? No, I'm not none of that. Man, I'm a rapper. I'm a rapper. So when it comes to me interacting with people who are in the same profession as me, that's like saying you can't interact with other sportscasters if they're not Christians. That's crazy. But back to the Bible. Yep. All right, here we go. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. <clears throat> Feel me. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Mic drop. That's why, Jay. Why you associate with this rapper? Why you did a song with this rapper? Why you go on tour with this rapper? Why you cool with Lupe Fiasco? He not a Christian, he a Muslim. Why you did a song with... Uh, juvenile or with Manny Fresh or with Big Crit or with uh, The Game or with all these people or with Kevin Gates or da da da. Man, read that and then come ask me that same question and I don't think you'll feel the same way. Like the answer, I want you to just clarify, expound on it a little bit more just personally just, just and obviously read through the scripture and it's great but just elaborate even more. Explain. What do you you think you're influencing them in a positive direction? I know that I got the light. I know that I got the light. I feel it. I feel it in me. You heard me? I know Christ is in me. I know I got the light. So if I'm around other light bearers, it's just to sharpen my iron and it's just to make that light even brighter. But when I'm really using this thing, this light that I got, I got to go where it's darkness. That's why I wanted to become a rapper. And so when I see these brothers and sisters who may not be having the same faith walk as me, it's not that I'm saying, oh, you just a person I can't associate with at all. It's you got the light in you, too. You just haven't recognized it yet. So let me come in the form of somebody who you can relate to, who's a fire rapper just like you. So we doing amazing music together. I got nothing but hits with all these people that you that you name and that I've collaborated with. Nothing but hit songs with them. Right. With that being said. Now when you're like, dang, this D, man, like I'm sitting there kicking it with him. Like, yeah. But D got this light that he's unapologetic about. And he's not saying this light comes from the universe or the galaxy or it's just his energy. He knowing that this light is God. This is Jesus Christ, you heard me? Straight up, who, who D is trying to be like. That has the ability to impact you. I ain't changed yet. Me and Kevin Gates did a song together in 2009 on my first album. The name of the song is called I Hate Money. Talking about being anti-materialistic, you feel me? Me and the game, we did a song called Shine On, where I'm rapping about Carl, my best friend getting killed. I'm rapping about other losses I've taken in my personal life and all this. He rapping about his brother getting killed when he was a teenager. We finding something that we relate on as human beings. And then we saying from there, we're gonna make great music, but I'm not finna water down what I stand for just so you could do a song with me. 
then that would be like Jesus becoming more like the people he hung with. Jesus didn't become a tax collector. Levi, a.k.a. Matthew, became a disciple. You feel me? And that's the goal with this stuff, man. I'm in this for the long haul. And so I, I think I agree with you, and, and I think it's reflective of, of tr how I try to be, but I do struggle with it because take, like, Kirk Franklin. All right. And, and you know, most days, most days, I pretty much start my morning uh, with Kirk Franklin and Rance Allen, something about the name of Jesus. But I struggle, like I saw Kirk Franklin, I think at the Grammys or somewhere, and he performed, and then the next performance might have been Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B, and some, and, or maybe it was the Sam Smith, and they all came out in red, and some kind of satanic ritual or whatever. And, and, and I was just like, man. But did Kirk come out with that? No, he didn't. Okay. But, but I was sitting there like, man, I just don't know if I, wanted, if I would want to be there. And again, this is like a struggle, a, a th uh, argument I'm having in my head. I got you, brother. Yeah. Jason Whitlock, YouTube is a sinful place. I agree. But we on YouTube right now, racking these views up. You heard me? <laughs> Straight up. We on YouTube. Man, we got to go. We got to go where it's at, bro. We got to go where it's at. This earth is a sinful place. We are here occupying real estate. Man, let's occupy that real estate in the music industry. Now, it's different if you were to say Kirk Franklin came out with them, with the devil horns, and performing that stuff. Now, come on. Come on, Uncle Kirk. They might be impacting you more than you impacting them. But that didn't happen. You said that didn't happen. With D1, show me when D1 is hanging around these rappers that y'all saying, oh, why are you hanging with these worldly rappers? Show me when D1 start cursing in his music. Show me when D1 stop proclaiming Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Show me when D1 start glorifying drug dealing and murder and disrespecting women. You heard me? Show me that. You can't show me that, man, because I know the mission I'm on. It's called Mission Vision. It's a whole lifestyle, man. It's a whole lifestyle. And, bro, you are one of them ones. You one of them ones, bro. So, like, so I thank you. I'm one of those ones. What do you mean? You one of them ones that's chosen to be able to stand boldly on your faith and what you believe in, but to be able to be in a space where you get to talk about freaking sports which everybody can relate to and so many people love. So now that's your entryway. I get to rap, which everybody loves hip hop. I get to rap, so I got your attention because I'm spitting that fire, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying, what's the point of writing? I ain't even gonna rap for you right now. I'm gonna rap for you after this. But we get to do this. We get to do this stuff, bro. But ultimately, we get to also interact with people. That's why, bro, it's important. Listen, if you see your other, they ain't got that many Christians in this space doing what you do, man. So when you see other Christians in this space, y'all might not agree on everything, but if they're not doing stuff that's leading people away from Christ, then at the end of the day, you gotta be like, hey man, if we got issues or whatever, we gotta figure out, we on the same team serving the same God. So when you got Deion Sanders, Ryan Clark, I know y'all ain't always been on the best of terms, but these brothers serving the same God that we serving. So at the end of the day, it's like, yo, are they, are they doing things that's leading people away from God? No. If you don't like their tactics of how he coaching or how he's commentating or whatever, then that's one thing, bro. But at the end of the day, we are teammates, man. That look bad for the body when we out here at odds with each other. Mm. Straight up. And same thing with me. Hold on, last thing. With me, same thing, bro. If there's other Christian entertainers who are out here, we might not agree on everything. But for me, I'm not going to speak on it all until I see that, wait, you are publicly putting stuff out there that's leading people away from Christ. You publicly putting out stuff that's gonna confuse people, like, like massively confuse people. Okay, we can speak on that. That's worth speaking on. But that's my thing, bro. We gotta stick together. I, I, you, you've unpacked something interesting where we're gonna have to sit here and marinate or continue on for a little bit. Start with, with Deion Sanders. The, the <clears throat> where I disagree with you is I don't think Dion and I uh, are trying to accomplish the same thing. I, I think Dion is highly, highly materialistic and promotes radical materialism. I, I think that Dion is the same age as me, and uh, we were college athletes at the same time, him at a super high level, me at a mediocre level. As a media person, I've covered his entire career. There's Dion's the same person he was at 19 years old, a radical materialist. He's covered it up with some 
scripture and some praying online or whatever. But at the end of the day, I th the reason why I'm critical of Dion is because I think virtually all of his actions uh, promote things that are antithetical to Christianity. I, I think he's embraced Christianity as a covering uh, for his radical materialism, and it's, it's a nice little ploy, but it, it's, it's like, take Snoop made a gospel album. That ain't covering up doggy style and all the other stuff. These are radical materialists, and materialism is destroying young black men. And so you don't think Dion's serving Jesus, bro? Come on, man. It's hard for me to judge. I think his actions speak that he's serving radical materialism. You just, we're the same age. I used to own big gold chains. And at some point you evolve and you go, this is crazy. What, what the, I'm 56 years old and I'm still running around here with big gold chains. And, and, and But where is that a sin that in the Bible? I to call it a sin. All right. I'm saying it's a promotion of radical materialism. Dion's an idol and I'm very hard on idols. Uh, idolatry is a big part. It's just like you said, little Wayne, it's got MOB tatted on and you see little kids. Uh, tatting MOB on. When I look at Dion and I see young men making very poor decisions so they can buy a gold chain and impress somebody, I blame Dion, rappers, and others. But in, in the sports media lane, no one, particularly in football, which is my sport, no one's had more of a, in my view, negative influence on the mindset of young athletes, and I would throw black in there as well, than Dion and his radical materialism, that, that everything is about money. Nothing is about true service. And, and so we have a fundamental disagreement about what Dion's real agenda is. And, and, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying I got a long history of covering his career, being involved in athletics, seeing his impact, I, 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 I trust my evaluation a bit more than yours, as you probably trust your evaluation more than mine, but mine is based off a lot of history. And so w what I see Dion doing when I see him uh, leave Jackson State <clears throat> and then go to Colorado, a virtually all white school, and then argue that uh, people are afraid of him because he's black and all that, that, that promotion of racial idolatry, that's not Christ-like. A lot of the stuff that he, he does public, it's just not Christ-like. It's, it's not a mature walk. It's, it's, and people actually defend him. Their number one defense is, this is the way Dion's always been. Whew, I hope, I hope I'm not the same as I was when I was 18, 19, 25, even 30. I hope I'm not the same as I was when I was 45. If I'm not evolving, what's the, what's the walk for? What, what, what's the journey? If I'm not different, man, if I'm not transformed, what's the point? Man, look, everybody, I'm going to get Jason Whitlock and Deion Sanders together. We're going to all be together. Three Christians, you heard me? I'm talking about, I'm going to be in the middle, <laughs> but I'm going to get y'all together. We're going to all be hugging. We're going to all be giving praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Dion going to be the one with the most ice and the most jewelry on. I'm going to be the one with the second most on. And you're going to be the one with... You camouflage a uh, zipper on, uh, you know what I'm saying? But we all three men who are serving the same God ultimately, who have three different looks, personalities, and styles. But at the end of the day, man, like you don't go that hard uh, pushing that you believe in something if you don't truly believe in it. Like, like you just don't, man. Dion constantly, and I've never met Dion, so I'm not, you know, up until this point. But I'm saying. When I you, have, but go ahead. When you publicly are putting out there who you are giving all the praise to. You and, never heard of false prophets? F but this is the thing. False prophets, do you know how many success stories there are from people saying like, yo, Dion coached my kids. Dion coached in this league. My kids are better because of this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Again, this is where, now, there's a lot of people mm -hmm. who are never given a platform mm -hmm. that would say just the opposite. There's a lot of people with a long line of complaints about Dion as well. Let me keep it 100 with you. I'm so glad we're having this convo. Yeah. I was in that room eating them good ribs just now and, and them good wings, you heard me, yeah. before we start taping. And somebody that was in there that shall remain nameless 
was talking about um, uh, a very well-known uh, high-profile pastor uh, out the great state of Texas. T.D. Jakes, yeah. Nope. Um, Joe Osteen. Joe Osteen, okay. Who, they are totally, like, convinced that, oh, uh, ain't no positive fruit coming from him. You know what I'm saying? And, and they were elaborating on that. And I'm like, okay, that's one way to look at it. But then there's a lot of people who feel like you. And there's also a lot of people who are like, yo, I gave my life to Christ in Joe Osteen's church. So my thing is, ultimately, until it become, if I'm in the industry, see, you got it good, bro. You don't have it like me. You got it good. I'm in the industry, Jay, where I'm fighting for people to say like, bro, if you're going, you're lying. First of all, you're lying. You ain't never killed nobody. You ain't never sold that much dope. Like, stop. Like, ma'am, you not out here living like how you say you are. Y'all are all lying, but y'all are lying and glorifying the most negative, dark, raunchy, like, like, worst side of you. You're lying in that direction. If a person is sitting here and if you say they're not being all the way truthful or something like that, but if what they're saying is constantly giving praise to God and saying, hey, I'm positive and I'm in the community and I'm dedicating my life to serving kids and teaching them the game of football, at least what you're doing is putting something out there that you may not agree that that's all the way who they really are, but it's a better version of who they are, that they're, that they're giving off. Not so they can appear to be perfect, but so that they know I got a platform and I want people to at least look up to a better version of me. People might listen to my music and be like, man, that dude D1 is amazing. Man, I'm a regular dude, man. I got flaws. I, 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 I'm, I'm a sinner. You know what I'm saying? But when I, when I, when I do this children's book that I did, this anti-bullying children's book called David Found His Slingshot, I'm going to make sure that I put an inspirational message in here because I got bullied as a kindergartner in New Orleans. When I do them 11 albums I got out, my newest album, From the Hood to Harvard, I'm going to make sure that I'm showcasing the side of me that can narrate what's wrong with this world but not glorify what's wrong with this world. So it's a difference, bro, and that's what I see is... You think humility is a fruit of the spirit? Fruit of the spirit? Yes, sir. Go ahead. I know where you're going. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, I do. There's, there's no humility with Dion. None. Never has been. What you? Man won a game at Colorado. Came in, and the first thing he started saying, "You believe in me now? You believe in me?" That's the first thing that came out of his. Jay, you in the heat of the moment. We both play sports. Come on, man. When I, I hit a when I hit a game winning shot, when Kobe hit a game winning shot. Never been fifty six. No. I have. And so has Dion. And so the things we did as a child, when we hit a shot, when we did something big on the football field, you shouldn't be doing them at 56. And I'm just saying, it's a very immature, right. look at me, walk. There's no humility. It's all about Dion. Everything. Okay. The way he treated a bunch of those kids. None of it Christ-like. Okay, I feel that. So watch this. Here's the thing. You've played for teams your whole life, as have I. Do teammates ever disagree? Of course. But when teammates disagree, they keep it well, in the locker room or on the practice field. Yeah, and we're disagreeing about what team Dion's on. Dion's on Team Dion is what my argument is. He Team Jesus, brother. He Team Jesus, Jay. That's what I'm saying, bro. They got a lot of people that's on Team Jesus that struggle with being on Team Them. We should be able to recognize them by their fruit. And, and like, I, I run around because I've had to be humbled. Mm -hmm. Because I was a very arrogant person and did very arrogant things. And, and again, I don't... Immature people can't see it, but it's like, I'm, I've really been humbled. And... That's why you hear me talking a lot about the dumb things I used to do and needed to be repaired from, repent from. But it took for you to get humble, Jay. No, I understand that. It took for that. So, so I'm saying... Life it, will do that to you. You got to right. remember, Dion's written a book where he talked about trying to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. He's been humbled. He's just rejected it. And again, th there would be any man that's lived the worldly life that he's lived and doesn't spend time Telling young people, boy, look at these mistakes I made. Look at, please don't do that. If you're not an elder, and you're an elder at this mm -hmm. point, you're teaching, mm -hmm. you're 38 yeah, yeah. years old, but as you get further along, our responsibility is to pass down this wisdom, mm -hmm. not to glorify ourselves, 
not to seek greater and greater riches, it's to pass on wisdom. And there's some wisdom that young people, but particularly black people, are missing. Mm -hmm. That Dion's so arrogant. He, the, 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 running around to my, calling Travis Hunter, he's him, or I am him, and all, that's ungodly. Come on, come on, Jay. Because I know, because the, the beautiful thing about me is, I'm the, we all brothers, me, you, and Dion. but I'm the brother that's definitely. in the middle. We, we brothers. No, no, definitely. And, and I don't mean brothers like black brothers. I'm no, talking no, no, about no. brothers, all right. No, no, in Christ. I'm brothers with all these people. Yeah, straight up, <laughs> all straight up. But I don't know their names yet, so we ain't talking about them. We talking about the three of us right now. With that being said, I'm just the one who can see. I'm like, Jason has great points when it comes to we shouldn't make ourselves into idols. Um, when Dion is sitting here and he's clearly giving praise and glory to our Lord, but he's also saying something that I know is just slang in the culture, saying I'm him. Uh, in the context of on the football field, I'm him. You know what I'm saying? I ain't never saw Jesus catch a touchdown. So when you're saying I'm him, like we talking about in the context of a football field, bro. And I'm saying this because I'm in the industry once again. Y'all got it good. Y'all playing sports. There's a lot of similarities between that and hip hop. But in hip hop, your whole life is centered around I have to promote myself to make a living. Like people have to buy my music. Why do you think Dion's filming everything? Bro. But so so that's something, but we're all public figures at this point, bro. I am aware of your show because your show promotes, it's called Fearless. With who? With Jason Whitlock. Not with Jesus Christ. You know what I'm saying? With Jason Whitlock. So we all have I'm this. Not him, but go ahead. I, I feel you, I feel you, brother. I feel you. And, and I'm that person who, right now, I've been having some high profile disagreements with other rappers in, in, in my culture that you may or may not, and bloggers in the I'm culture. Aware. You're aware of it. And I've had to figure out, Jay, I've been like, at times, people making threats against me. Uh, at times, people belittling all of the work that I've put in, you know, knowing that I'm a man of the people and I, I'm an educator, an amazing rapper with, with, a, with a discography that's, that's great, but also like a man of God first and foremost. And people try to minimize that to, oh, he's just a clout chaser trying to say other people's names to get on. When I'm like, bro, like, I want us all to be better, like all of us to be better, and I'm not... I'm not here for anything else. I don't have nothing against y'all. And in the midst of all that and people trying to come at me in different ways, I've had to say, you know what? I can't wait to give Jim Jones a hug. You heard me? I can't wait to give Rick Ross a big hug and we could go, huh, together. You know what I'm saying? I can't wait to dap Meek Mill off and embrace my brother. I can't wait to see Joe Budden and dap that brother off because at the end of the day, we have more in common than we have different. And if we have disagreements, as long as it's not over something like, did you take my girl or, or is, is my jewelry shinier than yours or who got more money? Nah, man, if we disagreeing in the midst of growing as a culture and helping us all be our best selves, that's okay. Cause you can't name me no brothers who ain't never got into it and fought. Like that's okay. And I just feel like that's what we gotta do at this point because there's some people who time and time again will choose to say, nah, like, that person has been cast off as you not on my team, period. You are serving the devil. But once again, in the Bible, I ain't see Jesus doing that. He was interacting with the people and he had his own. Telling the truth the whole time, though. He telling the truth the whole time. But I'm saying he had his own people like, why is he even associating with them? You got to have difficult conversations to solve difficult problems. And there's this racial idolatry problem that we are afflicted with amongst other things we're afflicted with in society, but we gotta be able to have difficult conversations with those people. You know what we gonna, this the thing, Jay, people don't wanna talk enough to where they be like, oh, okay, Jay, I'm with you until you start talking about Jesus. That's what I'm opposed to. Like, people don't wanna have that talk. They'll try to say, nah, I'm not with Jason because of how he attacks this person or because of how he says that. And my thing is I could see through all that and be like, man, at the core, this is somebody who is serving God in the way that he sees best fit to serve him. And if people don't understand your why, we just got to keep reiterating that to them. But to get to the point where we like, man, I'm not even trying to uh, associate with certain people simply because we're different on the surface, that, that's making Satan Only problem. because this was unpacked related to me is the only reason why I'm asking this. Do you think I wouldn't associate with Dion or Ryan Clark or any of these people? 
wouldn't associate with them? Yeah. Uh, are you so meaning like you would you would welcome a conversation with them? Of course. Okay. And do you, uh, there's starting with me. There ain't nothing but sinners on my show. Nothing but. Mm -hmm. And and take Warren Sapp's one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. he, at and <coughs> Warren, don't be offended by this, but at best, Warren would have to be called, at best, a lukewarm Christian. And, and so... Uh, he ain't gonna like that. <laughs> well, it, it, me and Warren keep it real. We'll never be offended by anything. But, but so th there, there's, there's nobody mm -hmm. that I wouldn't associate with, conversate with, anything... And again, I, I'd have to go back and rewatch everything I've said about Dion. But all of it is connected to like, oh, you claiming to be a Christian? How, Dion, humble yourself. D don't come into press conference doing this. You're, you're representing Christianity in a way to young people that's in effect. Don't bring in uh, every commercial gangster rapper you can to come talk to your kids. D don't do it. B bring D1. Bring Bryson Gray. Bring, elevate people that are trying to elevate Jesus Christ, not radical materialism. And, and so I would love to have a conversation with Dion. Mm -hmm. I have no animus towards Dion Sanders. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to say you standing with Christ and then not show the fruit and all it is is you putting out a video or two saying you standing with Christ, I'm going to call you out on it. And particularly, you're in a leadership position. You have so much influence in the culture, but none of these people. From people think I dislike or hate Shannon Sharp, but and, and again, he's not doing things the way that I would particularly do. Them. But what he's been doing with Club Shay Shay is really successful, and I've had to acknowledge that. And Pro professionally it. successful. Professionally mm -hmm. successful. I've had to. It's not what I would do, mm -hmm. and and he's not claiming. Now, I would be a lot harder. If he was out here claiming he's a Christian and all that other stuff, I'd be going a lot harder. Mm -hmm. so my criticisms of Shannon have been about, mostly about race, because the dude ain't got no problem with white people, certainly ain't got no problem with white women, and, but he wants to run out here and pretend like he's Malcolm X. Mm. He ain't never had a Betty Shabazz. He's a lot of Becky Shabazzes, but not a Betty. And, and so that's, it's the hypocrisy mm. that provokes me and makes me critical, but it, it's no kind of hate. And it, it's, it's just like, it's just like the, when I played football at Ball State, we were all on the same team. Mm -hmm. But there were guys on that team who had a problem with me because they thought, hey man, you ain't working hard enough. Mm. You ain't as down for the team as I am mm. and as we are mm -hmm. and as the level we need to win a championship. Mm -hmm. And so there were guys that were critical of me. We were on the same team, mm -hmm. but I wasn't putting in the level of work. And you know what? I didn't realize it then, but I certainly realize it now. They were right. We played for the MAC championship in mm -hmm. 1988. Mm -hmm. I was the starting uh, offensive tackle. I had to block a guy named Joel Smingy that played 12, 13 years in the NFL. If I had prepared harder, I would have done a better job against Joel Smingy. Instead, I gave up three sacks. We lost the game 16 to 12. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, at looking back with adult eyes, I was like, dang, I didn't live up to my responsibilities on that team. Mm -hmm. Dion is claiming to be on the Christian team. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like a teammate saying, bro, you ain't putting the work in. Now, now you out here fronting like you're on the team, but... I don't see it. But you're saying it publicly. Yeah. And and it's one thing that's He's doing it publicly. He's having major public influence. And you, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. You calling out rappers mm -hmm. and all this other publicly. Stuff. Publicly. So here's the thing. With Dion, you what you're not seeing Dion do is publicly lead people away from Christ or preach something that's anti gospel. You can lead people. T take my gluttony. Okay. My gluttony. The, and I profess my Christianity. I try to do. But my gluttony makes people question my Christianity. 
and the gluttony mm. among a lot of Christians, mm. particularly in the black church, mm. is one of the reasons why Christianity isn't as popular, mm -hmm. isn't as powerful in the black church, because we're sitting around with a physical sign of like, your God lets you walk around looking like that? Mm. And, and so there are actions we take as humans mm -hmm. that despite what comes out of our mouth, turns people away from God. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing, just like I have to sit here and publicly confess that my gluttony is a disservice to God and is harming team God mm. and turning people away from God, Deion Sanders, his lack of humility, his radical materialism, his embrace of every gangster rapper, it's an affront to God and makes Christianity look bad. Mm. And so if you do a podcast tomorrow and say, man, Jason Whitlock, 75 pounds overweight, that's a bad look for God. But you know what I would do? I'd have to eat that. You wouldn't see me anywhere whining and crying, oh, D1 don't mm. like me. That's unfair. Well, ladies and gentlemen, D1 new podcast about to drop. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's going to be called... I'm going to call it, I, I've been plotting on this. I'm going to call it Flipping Tables with D1. Because that's what I'm, just like Christ was flipping tables, you heard me? When he walked in that temple, flipping tables. And we're going to be, uh, we're going to get Jason Whitlock on there. We ain't going to talk about it. We're going to get him on there, you heard me? In a, in a wife beater. Uh, so, yeah, in all this glory. Yeah, all this gluttony. <laughs> but I feel you, brother. Um, I'm, I'm in the rap game to where I know it's the devil's playground, bro. And you just reminded me of my other point that I wanted to make. Is I think... Part of what you're arguing is like, now I'm calling out rappers and they're not even remotely trying to promote God. And th there you go. That's th what I'm saying. Th that's what you're saying. But, but here's what I want you to understand. The traditions that are different between the music industry and the sports industry. In the music industry, it's always been a little satanic. Okay. That's a lot more satanic, but it's always been secular. And so rappers and other entertainers that come into music and they're secular, that's the norm. And so they go do that. Mm -hmm. In the sports industry, it's always been connected to Christianity. Mm. Go, go look at who developed organized sports. The YMCA, Young Men's Christian Association. This is in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Sports, organized sports have always been attached to Christianity. The Catholic Youth Association, CYA or not CYA, Catholic Youth League or whatever, mm -hmm. they promoted the integration of sports mm -hmm. in the 1900s. Mm -hmm. Faith has always been a part of the sports deal. So in order to be successful in sports, everybody was programmed or conditioned to embrace Christianity. And so in order to be successful, you have to have that in the sports media because that's been the tradition, that's mm. been the custom. And so Dion is performing the custom mm. that's already been established. The rappers you're looking at, music, it's been secular. They're performing the custom. You're trying to be a disruptor in that and say, we're going to change this custom. Mm -hmm. and, but I'm saying Dion, for the, from my point of view, is just he's doing the performance that has been popular in sports since its inception. If, if in, at 56, in order to be real, real with it, I got to just see more fruit and I got to see more consistent action and I just can't write off things that I know are idolatrous, that I know are radical materialism. I just, ah, that's just an innocent mistake. Not at 56. We know what we're doing at 56. And every time I put that fork in my mouth, I know exactly what I'm doing. Mm. I can't plead ignorance. Mm. Yeah. My good friend Sarah Gonzalez is now hosting Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered. It's a show. Everyone's favorite spicy Latina coming to you five nights a week with a no holds barred take on news, politics, and culture. She's also joined by regular guests and newsmakers to help make sense of all the madness. You can watch on Blaze TV, the Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered YouTube channel, or listen wherever you get your podcast. The show looks great. It's vintage Sarah. I also never know where she's going to take a story or what she has to say. Tune in and check it out. It's Sarah Gonzalez, Unfiltered.
man, I want to rap. Can I rap? My cool day. Yeah. <laughs> Just because people will be like, man, this dude, they having an amazing conversation, but he say he's a rapper. So <laughs> this is because this is, I, I seek to not only tell my story, but to bring a form of enlightenment when I rap to people. So an example is, uh, I need another title. I'm no longer a rapper. I'm a rhyming revolutionary, authoring chapters. In this book we call life, here to give you instructions on fighting self-destruction over beautiful production. I don't fit in. I don't drink, smoke, or pop pills. I don't even curse up in my music, but it's hot still. I'm all in the hood, and I ain't even strapped. Simba, burrito, you're lying in your raps. Sometimes I be sad, I be crying in my raps. Wrote this on a plane, I be flying in my raps. Man, I deal with pain that they couldn't even fathom. But all the blessings people be praying for, I didn't have them. I'm not from this place, maybe heaven, maybe Saturn. They sleep on me, I wake them up, they love me. That's the pattern, huh? Who cares if you die rich, if you ain't dynamic? God really got my back, J. Why panic? Feel me? That's good. Is yeah. that that's, a song. that's on my new album that I just put out. Yeah. I just put an album out Tuesday. It's called From the Hood to Harvard. And what are you doing at Harvard? So I'm a fellow at Harvard University. I'm a hip hop fellow, which is a position where I'm able to do research around the impact that hip hop music has on our culture. Positive, negative, what have you. And I've also, while I've been at Harvard, been teaching classes over there in various departments. So I'm at Harvard University in Boston as a fellow, and I'm at Tufts University in Boston as a professor and the artist in residence. I have my own class that I teach called The Intersection of Hip Hop and Social Change. So, um, Harvard, I think of as one of the most secular places on earth. Oh yeah, that, that's why I love it, because it's secular. So that means I got work to do, I got a light to shine. I got people to enlighten. Sign me up. I've never been afraid of them environments. I'm there. And, and they not believing in God. And they sitting here like science and the universe and da-da-da. And I'm hitting them with that word. And I'm not watering down. And I'm one of the dopest rappers in the world. So when y'all hear me, y'all are like, dang, the music is tight. And he wrote a children's book. And the children's book is amazing. And it's selling thousands and thousands of copies. And like, dang, and he's intelligent. And that's how we got to be, man. We got to be so good at what we do as believers that even if you don't want to like it, you can't deny it. What did you think of the Cat Williams interview? Did you watch it? Of course I watched it, man. Oh, okay. You, 60 million people watch it, so... Yeah. <laughs> but it, what did you think? Yeah, I thought that it was the perfect formula of charisma, name-calling, and comedy and lived experience to where you put that all in a big old pot of gumbo and you get viral. That's what it was, man. I just felt like uh, Cat is one of the funniest comedians in the world. Mix that with him having all these people whose names he was calling and speaking about, he knows these people, he has real experiences with them. So he's telling real stories, but clearly, he has a chip on his shoulder to where he felt like, I'm finna get all them chips off my shoulder in this one interview. And he's, he's charismatic. Shannon Sharp is charismatic, you know what I'm saying? You put them across from each other, we charismatic, you know what I'm saying? It makes for good conversation, but it's also what the public wants, which is, ooh, who's beefing with who now? You know what I'm saying? Like, like who, who beefing with who? Cause that's, that's what we want, that's gonna go viral. And then the next thing is, well, what's their response to him? It was all of that mixed in one, bro. What do you think about him calling 2024 the year of truth? I mean, cause literally when I think, I would, one, I think of some of the things you've said about the hip hop industry and just the music yeah. industry. Yeah. 2024, the year of truth. I like that. Cause a shift is happening right now. Absolutely a shift is happening. People are waking up. People are being bold about speaking truth and being unapologetic about who feels however. It's just like, look, you might not like it, but that don't mean I'm not gonna say it. So this is definitely the year of truth. Industry plants. I saw an interview, I watched an interview with you where you talked about industry plants in the music industry and, and, and uh, Kat obviously saying something Similar. What, what's your take on industry plants in the, in the music industry? Because I'd look at 
I'll just say what I believe and, and people can read into it or whatever, but Tech Nine is the most talented rapper I've ever seen, heard, witnessed. But he more, would never uh, more more than D one? I don't know, bro. Just in this dude's a incredible storyteller. Ball for ball. I'm just I'm just yeah. joking, right? Shout, shout out to Tech Nine. I hear what you said. But the industry he was always at war with the industry. He wouldn't hop on board. Not not over religious beliefs or whatever, but yeah. it's just like he wanted, he likes complicated rhymes and yeah. choruses. He likes real storytelling. He never wanted to dumb down his music. And he independent. He an independent mogul. Yes. And so, but he, he just didn't want to dumb down his music. And so he was always at, at, at war with them. And, and so I... He could, I mean, every, from Quincy Jones, everybody was like, oh, Tech Nine, he got next, he's this, he's that. But he wouldn't play the game. And to me, when I look around and go like, again, I'm not asking you to call names, but I'm just telling you what I seriously think. When I look around, Sexy Red, mm -hmm. there is zero talent here. Mm. A two-year-old mm. could do what she's doing mm. and and... Not, but I don't even want to just sing up most, many of these rappers that male and female, it's like, there's no talent here. Ba uh, uh, Jay, I said, um, Jay, there is talent, there's no guidance. There's talent, there's no guidance. My booty hole's brown, my coochie's pink. That takes talent? That takes talent to, to say something like that because I've never thought about what color my booty hole is my whole life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Like, you clearly think different than most people to even think about, like, what color your booty hole is. Um, <laughs> like, that takes, that takes talent, but that's no guidance. And that's my thing is, like, I see a lot of talent in the music industry, but um, I either see no guidance or I see the wrong guidance. So to answer your question about industry plants, absolutely industry, industry plants exist. And the powers that be want charismatic ignorance to be at the forefront of the music industry, especially when it's impacting our people. Because you don't see that charismatic ignorance at the forefront of the industry when it's affecting white people. You don't see that. You got a couple outliers who, like, oh, he just happened to break through or whatever, but they don't want that to become the dominant uh, force that is uh, teaching and entertaining their youth. That's not the case. But we also can't blame this solely on white people, because at this point, we are aware of what's going on, and we are complicit with it, and we are participating in it as black people. So what do you, my contention is that we have a culture, a, a black culture, that does not in any way want to end anti-black racism. They want to benefit from it, period, end of story. They're not anti-minstrel show. They're pro-minstrel show mm -hmm. as long as they have the starring role in it and mm -hmm. the paycheck that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. And so that, 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 no one wants to end anti-black racism among black people. We just want to profit from it. That's true of a lot of people. A lot of people do feel like that. I'm not one of those people, and I know a lot of people who don't feel like that who are trying to work to be part of the difference. I started something called the Platinum Pledge, right? In the music industry, going platinum is like the standard, that's like the Super Bowl. So I turned platinum into an acronym. People leading a transformation involving negative, unhealthy music, right? That's what platinum stands for. Say that again, I love that. People leading a transformation involving negative, unhealthy music, right? And this transformation is simply people who feel like, you know what? I want to take a vow publicly to say that I stand on the side of not wanting to create, support, or promote music that's glorifying murder, that's glorifying drug dealing and drug use, that's glorifying the disrespect of women, and that's glorifying sexual irresponsibility. For the people who are tired of the minstrel show going on and who are like, this is what I'm standing on, then I'm getting people to sign the Platinum Pledge. It's on my website. It's at d1music.com, D-E-E, -E, the number one, music.com, slash Platinum Pledge. And it's literally something where I'm like, you know what? God don't like that lukewarmness. 
I'm just here to draw a line in the sand and simply ask my industry, what side of the line are you on? If you're on the side that wants to be a part of the minstrel show and you enjoy that, then just say that. Just say it, make it known so we can know, okay, that's where you at, you heard me? And if you're on the side that's like, nah, I'm tired of that stuff, then cool, let it be known because we all need to come together, those of us who feel like we're tired of it. And it's more than just one or two of us, Jay. I've got so many thousands and thousands of people to sign this at this point. I ain't even started calling my celebrity friends yet and my other fellow artists who I know agree with this and they're going to sign it. I ain't even got Jason Whitlock to sign it yet till I can tell everybody, hey, Jay signed it, y'all. You feel me? Like, because then that's going to, you're an influencer. So that's going to make people be like, whoa, we want to sign that as well. Like, that's what I'm on right now is organizing. I can entertain, but I don't want to just be an entertainer and be at the lowest level of the totem pole. Like, yeah, boy, go entertain, go entertain. I'm going to entertain and give God all the glory the whole time, but I'm also going to organize all of those of us who feel like this. And now when we see the people that's on the other side of the line, I got a song called Lines Drawn. It's on my album, From the Hood to Harvard. It's the first song. This song gives you goosebumps, Jay, when you hear it and when you see the video, right? And it talks about me drawing this line in the sand. And now it's like I messed the ant pile up. You know how if it's an ant pile and you go and you take a, a, a stick and you, and you draw a line through the ant pile, you see all them ants start scattering? That's what's happening now. Because what did cats say? This is the year of truth. So we ain't, we ain't being silent about not putting truth out there. And we also not being complicit with a watered down version of what truth is. So that's just, that's where I'm at, man. And I feel great. I, I feel great about the shift that's happening right now, but we need the fans. We need the people. Cause the artists, we can do this all we want and say what we stand for and we represent light. And my motto is be real, be righteous, be relevant. You know what I'm saying? We could, we could throw our threes up all day, real, righteous, relevant. But unless the fans are supporting that, we won't get too far. And that's the difficult part, Jay. You mentioned gluttony. Thank you for being transparent. You might talk about that all the time for all I know. So maybe you want Okay. Hey, these guys get tired of hearing them. Okay, cool. That was my first time hearing it. I appreciate you sharing that with me, right? That's equivalent to saying, like, you wasn't just born gluttonous, you feel me? But it's all this delicious food that exists in this world that's unhealthy for us, but it is delicious, you heard me? That's what the rap game has become. It's a lot of delicious poison. It's poisonous. A lot of it is contributing to keeping us held down, to killing us, to getting people locked up in jail. My boy Carl ain't on his earth no more, you heard me? And I know that the music we was listening to and that he was partially trying to emulate, I know that played a role. I know that played a role in the direction his life went. But it's so delicious and that beat is banging. So these women listening to it, they're like, dang, these dudes disrespecting me, talking about running a train on me, cursing me out, calling me the B word, the H word. But the beat is so catchy and the hook is so repetitive and all my friends like it. So next thing you know, the women is liking it and saying all that stuff. And we making music like we're literally reciting music that's rapping about I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I killed you already. I'm going to kill you. Like, and I, I wish you would play with me. Just take the beat from under it and say those same lyrics. I did that in my class yesterday. Oh, y'all like this song? Oh, word for real? Cool. Let me just read the lyrics to y'all. Let's not listen to it with the beat and with the flow. And it got real awkward in that classroom, Jay. It got real awkward. And that's what we need. We need it to get real awkward right now. I almost hate to ask you this question because it, it's, I'm not confident it's a great question, but. But you're going to do it anyway. Yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, and it's not, it's not what you think. Uh, What's it like for a Christian rapper in terms of there's young people out there that, hey, I want to do rap. And, and, but man, if, if I stick to my values and what I believe, man, I'm going to be broke. Uh, you know, it, it's not, I won't be popular. I won't be. And, and so in your lane, you've been at this now for your 38, a decade plus. 20 years. Yeah. Uh, I'm in my 15th season in the league. That's how I say it, because I'm a sports fan. So if this was the league, I'm in my 15th year right now. Got you. And so, you know, we know Lil Wayne, Birdman, and Jay-Z. Jay-Z's a billionaire, blah, blah. What's it like for a Christian rapper? What, what, and again, this is why I say it's a bad question, because, you know, God's going to provide, and it's, it's but kids want to know. Am I broke? 
Not asking that, but am yeah. I a struggling rapper financially? Yeah. Far from it. Thank you, God. By the grace of God, I say that. And I will never flaunt. And oftentimes, Jay, I go back and forth on, I know that that's the, the candy that people want in this culture, bro. And I got my eyes closed just because I don't want to tear up. Because it's like, I know that our culture wants to see the jewelry, the fancy cars, talking about how much money you got, because that's what will make a lot of people say, oh, all right, whatever you pledge an allegiance to, I want a piece of that because now you got the, the toys, you got the candy, you know. But I also know that that's not of God is to be like that. So I still drive behind the accord and I don't talk about how much I got, you know, and like I don't flaunt that stuff. Like I said, all of this, man, this ain't nothing expensive. Um, I'm doing very well by the grace of God. And I need people to know that without me having to get out of character and play the world's game of showing it or whatever. I own real estate on Harvard University's campus. Not only am I a fellow there, but I literally own real estate on Harvard's campus. You know what I mean? Think about that. Of course, I got stocks. Of course, I got uh, apartment complexes. Uh, I'm saying, of course, but I'm telling you this stuff. You know what I mean? In addition to, like, just constantly booked for concerts, speaking engagements. I just did an album from the hood to Harvard to where... Bro, we get paid one third of a penny for every stream we get on the streaming platforms. One third of a freaking penny. That means if you listen to my album and it got nine songs, top to bottom, I just made three cents by you downloading and listening to my album. I said, forget that, that's y'all industry. I'm not gonna play by y'all rules. So I've allowed my fans to go to my website and if they wanna get the album, name their own price on my website, d1music.com. My fans have showed up and showed out, Jay, and come on my website by the thousands and purchasing the album. They can still stream it. Got my own streaming player and they can still download the music. But in naming their own price now, I've made more from doing it like that than I heard Snoop say he got a billion streams and got forty five thousand dollars. I'm like, Uncle Snoop, I love you, brother. But shoot, I ain't get nowhere near a billion streams, but. I did better than that, you know what I mean? So it's like, yo, that's just letting, that's just letting you know the answer to that. And that's, and that's letting the... Is anybody else doing that? That's a brilliant idea. If, the, if they're streaming you and you get a third of a penny, why not? It would much better, even if they just gave you a penny for, your, for the song. Literally. That's better than... <laughs> then a third of a penny for literally, my brother. I am no longer playing by the industry's rules because the industry has their own agenda and they were set up to profit by any means necessary. So I will not conform to y'all morals. I will not conform to y'all economic structure because y'all want me to be broke and moralless being in your industry. But you give me a little bit of popularity and you think that that should appease me. Man, forget that. I'm blessed financially and I'm blessed morally and spiritually because, yeah, I don't have to even try to pander to y'all for y'all acceptance. Like, there's a lot of platforms like this that they know I got the followers for it. I got 600,000 Instagram followers. I got almost half a million on Facebook. I got almost 200,000 on YouTube. I got TikTok popping. Yo, a lot of the mainstream platforms, they won't let a person like me on because they don't want this convo that we just had for the last hour and some change. They don't want that because that's a threat to everything that they stand for. For you, you just like, this young brother talking my language right now. Like, and we don't agree on everything, which is fine, but this is like rich. This is rich dialogue, you feel me? The industry don't want that. So I'm just like, cool, I don't need all of that stuff. I'm gonna go where I'm celebrated, not where I'm tolerated. So yeah, to answer your question, um, has anybody else, you heard anybody else doing that? Yeah, man, other artists are waking up, absolutely. Now, now the masses ain't doing it yet, so I'm an early adopter, but absolutely other artists are doing this, man, absolutely. Because people are seeing and understanding, they're like, dang, okay, this is what happens? Um, I can have all these streams and hardly make any bread? Like, that ain't right. Hold on, well, what's an alternative? And then you get people who you see, they are living the alternative. I'm living the alternative. So as fans are listening to this, if you're gonna go and get From the Hood to Harvard album, my, my 11th album that I've put out, my most recent one, 
You can go to my website if you really want to sow a seed into me, d1music.com, D-E-E, the number one, music.com, and get it and name your own price. Or if you want to go to Spotify and Apple and all that, it's there too. You can go get it there. I ain't going to be mad at you, but I just know that I got some people that's like, I love your heart and your art. I want to support you directly. I'm going to come to you. And you got other people that's like, I just heard about you, young brother. I don't know if I'm all the way sold yet. Let me go listen, you know, basically for free on, on those platforms. Either way, it's all good because it's about the message as well as the monetary reward. Wow. I, I feel like I just learned something and I'm trying to figure out, I wonder how I can apply that to what I... <laughs> Man, you need to make me your manager, bro. If you make me your manager, I have me, you, Dion, Ryan, Clark, all together, you heard me? Kumbaya and showing love. I have your pockets straight to where, look, look, Jay, we gonna do it like this. I'm saying, bro, you just... I, I gotta be real, I can't, no. My pockets ain't hurting, but I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow, that's fascinating. Jay, did innovation usually comes from a place of necessity. That's true. It was a necessity that we found a different model. It, it absolutely was. It was too many artists that were too talented that were still dead broke because of how the streaming revenue system is set up. So it's like, nah, man, I, like, I'm not going for it. I'm, I'm not going for it anymore, and I'm proud to do something different. So when I got fans that are proud to come and name their own price for my music, I was just like, hey, this is something that probably should have been done. But guess what it's a threat to? It's a threat to the mainstream music industry because, uh-oh, he's no longer an economic slave. Uh-oh, D1 could make more on releasing one album than he made in the last five years combined by putting his uh, album on the streaming platforms. And he could make that in a month. They don't like that. So, uh, man, I want to... You obviously like sports. Love. I sports. Yeah. All sports. Sports is my first love. Yeah. We, I, bro, what? What you about to say? Well, I'm saying we got to figure out how to get you on the show more often. Just to, to talk, yeah. Sports or All that. You can Skype in from Boston or yeah. whatever. Uh, yeah. Love to, you know, tell you what I would really love. You know, we do a, a roll call event, a men's summit. Uh, this will be our second year of it. And it's all about inspiring men to live a more godly life. Uh, are you old enough to, you ever heard of something called Promise Keepers? No, sir. Okay, uh, Promise Keepers used to be a really big event that was sponsored by the, the University of Colorado's football coach, Bill McCartney. It was about men coming together as Christians and fellowshipping together and mm. just calling each other into repentance and into response. Anyway, we started something called Roll Call. We did it last year. It's gonna be again June 1st uh, here in Nashville. Uh, they're putting up some images up on screen, but uh, we have musical performances and a Who lot you of got? speakers. You ain't got D1 yet? Well, again, that's what, that's, that was the next thing. Oh, I want you to come to Roll Call. Okay. Uh, and, mm. and June, it's a Saturday, June 1st. Yeah. Uh, I go to Africa. Um, I go to Africa. I, I just got selected as a United States hip hop cultural ambassador. So I'll be in Zimbabwe but that's in July for like most uh, for like most of that month, or for like three weeks. So June, I think I'm gonna check with we my. We pay team. you. Yeah, no, I, th I think June first sound good. I'll be in the states. Yeah, we, we would pay you, and you know, uh, but yeah, would love for you to be a part of that. And if you wanted to speak, even if you didn't even want to just rap. How about both? Yeah, obviously. Speak and rap. Pay you the same amount, but. Uh. <laughs> Here you go. Man, you got to talk to my people, man. You try to get a two for one, man. But anyway, would love to have you back and would love to ha just have you pop on from time to time for 10, 15 minutes. If there's something going on in the sports world, I, I imagine you're an NBA fan. Big time, bro. Yeah, NFL, college, NBA. I know, I know what you said about the NBA. I, I heard your, uh, your episode on the All-Star Game yeah, and okay, glo man. globalism yeah. has ruined. Uh, okay, well, yeah. you, you, you're, you're paying attention. Well, anyway, would love to have you be a contributor on the show. Uh, and so we'll talk about all that. But thank you so much, brother, for uh, coming into town. You been to Nashville before? Of course, man. Oh, I've yeah, performed here many times, yeah. and I, I absolutely love it. Thank you, though, man. Thank you, because... Uh, People don't know the behind the scenes of how things go sometimes. And uh, if anything, 
you were proactive on me. I was slacking, you know what I'm saying? Once I had this opportunity and then I got busy, slipped my mind. Thank you for nudging me and thank you for believing in me, man. Um, you know, Jay, they got people that's gonna judge me just for coming on your show because of how they view like, oh, I think of Jason Whitlock and automatically we don't associate with him. Who is we? The only we is me and he, you heard me? So like there's people that- See, That was what my thing about the whole conversation is like, they won't associate with me. I'm perfectly fine associating with them. I know what I'm standing on. Mm. And, and they can't move me off of it. Mm. They're not standing on much, or they wouldn't be scared. Everybody said they're standing on business nowadays. <laughs> we got to make sure we're standing on kingdom business. Yes. You heard me? That's yeah. all it is, man. And I, I'll just say that, yeah, um, I, know, I know that there's people out here who you may be at odds and all that type of stuff with. And one thing that's important, though, is just to remember that uh, God has us on this earth to, I mean, I'm not going to preach to the choir, bro. You know that. But God has us on this earth to stay focused on spreading his message. And whenever Christ was disagreeing with people, it's just important to know and understand that at a certain point, it was like, I ain't see Christ have no long pronounced uh, beefs with nobody. You know what I'm saying? It was almost like, oh, we got differences. We're going to acknowledge that, da, da, da. But then I got a bigger mission. You know what I'm saying? So let's just not let that stuff linger and fester. And I'm saying that talking to you, the big homie, but I'm also saying that to myself as it's like, D, now you and other rappers, people feel like y'all got beef or y'all at odds. Man, I love all them brothers and I can't wait to hug them because hugging them doesn't mean that I have to agree with everything they say or back down off standing on my kingdom business, but hugging them can show other people that like, we not just out here to be contrarians with no end goal in mind. Thank you, uh, D1, that was awesome. Uh, we'll play some tomorrow, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom No negotiation, my system, no relation We all just want to have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all deceiving We all want to be free We want